How did this small river help with building some of the world's biggest ships? And where in the city can you still find evidence from the heyday of transatlantic ocean travel? And what's the story of Glasgow's two queens? Find out now on this episode of Astonishing Glasgow. This is the River Cart, as it passes through Cathcart, not far from where I grew up. I used to cross the historic Snuff Mill Bridge every morning on the way to school, and I still cross it every day on the way back from work. This bridge will be celebrating its 300th birthday next year, so it may get a video of its own at some point. Let me know if that's something you'd like to see. Anyway. It's hard to believe that this small river could have any link to massive ocean liners, but here we go. The river cart, technically the white cart at this point, flows for roughly 15 miles to Renfrew, where it meets the black cart before joining the River Clyde right here on the south bank opposite the shiny new Clyde Bank College campus. It's hard to believe, but this whole area was the site of one of the most famous shipyards in the world. Shipbuilding began here in 1871, when J&G Thompson moved their engineering and shipbuilding yard here, when their original yard was taken over by the Clyde Navigation Trust to build Princess Dock. That's the same dock that was the site of the 1988 Glasgow Garden Festival. The reason they chose this site was the extra width the River Cart estuary added to the River Clyde. In 1899, the J&G shipyard was bought out by the company founded by Sheffield engineer Sir John Brown. John Browns were building tankers, dredgers, ferries, yachts and warships for Britain and Australia in the lead up to World War I, but its notoriety came from being Cunard Line's preferred shipyard. From this very land, flagship liners like the Lusitania, the Aquitania, the QE2 and the Queen Elizabeth were built. The amount of men who once worked here and the size of the ships that were constructed is now hard to imagine. But the outline of one of the old slipways is still marked by rows of cobbles showing their path across the college campus, and the very end of the slipway can still be seen when the tide is out. Arguably the most famous ship to be built here, by John Browns, would be the RMS Queen Mary. She was launched right here by Queen Mary herself on 26th of September 1934. Her stern heading out into the car estuary, before being arrested by the tugs and moved into the fitting out basing to have her interior finished off. And what an interior it is, as I was lucky to see firsthand when I spent the night on board in 2019 at the start of a Californian road trip. If you want to see that full video, the link's above, but wait till the end of this one before you go. The Queen Mary is now permanently berthed in Long Beach, California, and although the last few years have caused the hotel to close, she is now being spruced up and will be open again as a hotel soon. Now this is astonishing Glasgow, not astonishing Long Beach, California. So we need to get back to our home city somehow, and the next part of the story will get us back on the Clyde. Before we do however, please remember to like this video and subscribe to my channel. It's dead easy, just click the buttons below. Thank you very much. So when Queen Mary's hull was being started at John Brown's, she was officially known as Hull 534. Ships don't get their name until they're launched. Q2 
Cunard Line wanted their new ships to exude style, luxury and class. And what better than to name them after the greatest queens who ruled Britain. As Hull 534 was being laid, a meeting was held between Cunard Line and King George V to seek his permission. Cunard wanted to name their new ship the Queen Victoria, and when they asked King George V for permission to name her after Britain's greatest queen, story has it that he said Mary, his wife, would be so proud. The men from Cunard Line never had a chance to tell them what they wanted to call the ship. At that point, it was too late. You don't tell a king he got it wrong. You roll with it and you fix it. And so Hull 534 would be launched as the Queen Mary. Now, changing the name doesn't seem like a big deal. It's easier to paint, it's got fewer letters, but there was one big fly in the ointment, and that was back on the River Clyde. And would you believe, this was what caused all the problems. Launched in 1933, a year before the Queen Mary, the RMS Queen Mary, this is the TS Queen Mary, or Turbine Ship Queen Mary. The TS Queen Mary operated on the Clyde throughout the summer seasons, carrying 13,000 passengers a week from Glasgow to Arran, and you can't have two ships on the Lloyds Registry with the same name. So until a solution was found, Cunard could not launch the RMS Queen Mary. In 1935, Cunard Line asked the owners of the turbine ship Queen Mary, Williamson and Buchanan, if they could change the name of their ship to the Queen Mary II. Thankfully an agreement was reached and Glasgow was able to keep a Queen Mary, whilst Cunard could have its flagship without offending the King. The RMS Queen Mary sailed the transatlantic route to New York until its retirement in 1967 and her last voyage to Long Beach, California. She was finally removed from Lloyd's Register and in 1976 the original Queen Mary could lose her number 2 status, but it wasn't a good time for her either. As the Queen Mary II she had operated as a passenger ship to Arran and a mail ship to the Scottish Islands during the war. By the 1960s, when my dad took this cine film, she was operating day trips and cruises to Guruk, Inverary, Campbelltown and Rothsey, even having her masts lowered to fit under the newly built Kingston Bridge. By 1977, with passenger numbers falling, she was withdrawn from service after working for over 40 years. Bought initially by Glasgow City Council, with a plan to make her a floating museum, she was laid up but with funds for her conversion never materialising, she was sold again three times and in 1987 she became a floating venue with two bars and two function rooms on the River Thames in London. Just along the embankment from Cleopatra's Needle which popped up in episode 25 of Astonishing Glasgow. That part of her life lasted until 2009. She was then towed to Tilbury Docks to be prepared for the next chapter as a restaurant and fitness centre, but that unfortunately never happened. She was sold a number more times and was failing to be maintained, so by 2015, with bills for its birth unpaid and its seaworthy status in doubt, it was prohibited from leaving and the threat of her being scrapped was very real. Thankfully a bid was made by the newly formed Friends of TS Queen Mary and she was purchased by the charity in 2015. Funds were raised from donations across the UK, spearheaded by late actor Robbie Coltrane and repairs were made allowing her to return to the Clyde, where she was towed back into James Watt Dock in Greenock on the 15th of May 2016. On the 19th of November 2016, she returned to Glasgow and was berthed at the entrance to Prince's Dock beside the Science Centre. More funds were raised to allow her to be moved alongside the Govan Graving Docks, and major work has begun to restore her to working order. So let's hope that one day I will be able to make an astonishing Glasgow video right on board this very ship. That would be truly special. Until that day, the only way to experience being on board either of the Queens is to head to Long Beach, California.
or is it? What if I told you that you only needed to go to Glassford Street in the city centre? This is the steps bar and the first clue is on the sign. But before we go in, we need to go back to the Bellhouston Park in the summer of 1938. On the 3rd of May 1938, the Empire Exhibition was opened in this very park by guess who? Queen Mary. Multiple pavilions and exhibition spaces were built to showcase crafts and industries of Britain and British Empire countries. Again, I could probably do a full video on this. Let me know if that's something you want to see on Astonishing Glasgow. One of the pavilions was the Palace of Engineering and inside it featured a bar crafted by the men at John Brown's shipyard and designed to emulate the Art Deco glamour of the recently launched Queen Mary. The Empire Exhibition was dismantled at the end of the summer in 1938. Many of its displays put into storage or sold off. And with the outbreak of World War II, a lot of it was forgotten about. The Cunard Bar was stored by a building firm during the war, then sold to the Taylor family in 1949. Mr Taylor was the owner of the Steps Bar in Glassford Street and the bar was reassembled through these doors where it has remained ever since. A true one-off interior, it features sleek veneer panelled walls, Australian walnut counters and gantries, and in the lounge, along with the bell pushes on the wall for table service, it has a glorious stained glass panel featuring the Queen Mary herself. In nearly 70 years, the bar has remained mostly unchanged. Apart from some new floor coverings and chairs, the only major modification was the addition of a ladies' toilet in 1950. Even the family who own and operate the pub are the very same family. In a world of chain pubs and Witherspoons, this is an incredible thing in a city centre. And what's more, they couldn't have been more helpful or welcoming when I asked if I could have access to film. So thank you very much to Alan, Kevin and Christine for your time. Sadly, when I was there, some idiot had decided to smash the etched glass windows at the front of the pub. At a cost of £20,000, they are being replaced, so the outside will once again look great. If you're in Glasgow City Centre and you have the time, pop along to the Steps Bar for a whisky and enjoy the authentic Art Deco interior. And you now have the valid excuse that you are sightseeing or conducting research. Keep an eye on the Friends of the TS Queen Mary Facebook page for progress reports on her restoration. And if you ever find yourself in Long Beach, California, why not book a stay on the Queen Mary? You may even see some of the famous ghosts. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Astonishing Glasgow. If you enjoyed it, please hit that thumbs up button. If you want to see more, check out the other episodes on my channel and hit that subscribe button to get notified when the next episode appears. If you are feeling really generous and want to help me make more videos about Glasgow's astonishing past, please hit that super thanks button and give what you can. I appreciate every pound. Thank you so much again for watching and I will see you next time in Astonishing Glasgow. I'm off for an Empire Biscuit and a Bloody Mary. Bye now.